Yesterday at the State Department, NBC News intrepid veteran aggressive reporter Andrea Mitchell uh, once again became the personification of pushy persistence in trying to get some information out of the new Secretary of State, trying to get him to answer questions, any questions, trying to get him on the record on anything. Again, welcome. Mr. Secretary, China has said there will be consequences for the deployment now of anti-missile defenses in South Thank Korea. You. Thank you. Can you can you respond to can you respond to all? Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Secretary. Can you respond to the threats from China? Thank you. Thank you. Let's go. Thank you. Mr. Minister, are you sure the Trump administration will be strong against Vladimir Putin? Thank you, guys. We're leaving. We haven't been in yet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, can you, Andrew, can you assure us that Russia Andrew, will Andrew, not be able to move sorry. further in Ukraine? Press is departing you. We haven't had any time in here. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. We're how we need to go. Let's go. Let's go, guys. Andrea Mitchell is a very nice person, but she's obviously dogged at her work. And at the end of that clip, you can see how frustrated. She is there, right? After Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has given absolutely no response to any questions, after Andrea and all the other reporters were pushed out of the state, out of the room at the State Department by uh, State Department staff. And I mean, it's clear, State Department staff know Andrea well enough to be on a first name basis with her. They have seen her around at the State Department for years, if not for decades. But the Secretary of State won't say a word, won't say a word. And, I, you know, watch it. You see the look on Andrea's face there. I think part of the reason that Andrea seems so frustrated here is because this isn't a one-time thing. This keeps happening. This is the second time in just a few days that Andrea has been put in this position. Mr. Secretary, can you do your job with the kind of budget cuts the president has proposed? What does it say about the priority of diplomacy in this administration. Do you think you'll have a deputy anytime soon, sir? Thank you. We're done. Thank you. Come on, guys. When do you think you might have a deputy? Andrea, this way. Come on, guys. Come on, let's go. Andrea, come on, guys. This way. Thank you. Out, please. Out. When we first played that that tape a few days ago, my reaction to it, you might remember, my reaction to it spontaneously was, raise your children to be reporters, right? I mean, it is amazing tape of Andrea Mitchell and how she works and how hard she pushes to try to get information out of people in power. But you know what? In addition to being an interesting thing there to see in terms of what it means to be a reporter and how hard Andrea works, there is something very serious going on there. Right? What Andrea Mitchell was asking there, right? What does she say exactly? Do you think you will have a deputy anytime soon? When do you think you will have a deputy? No. Can you do your job with the kind of budget cuts this president has proposed? Do you think you'll have a deputy anytime soon? You know what? There is no deputy to Rex Tillerson at the State Department. And his public appearances really are just silent tableau vivant of smiling men shaking hands and not speaking and not answering reporters' questions. That's it. When Rex Tillerson first arrived at the State Department, he did give a speech to employees in which everybody thought he seemed very nice, but he has not held a press conference or made any sustained public remarks of any kind since then. And you know what? Immediately after he introduced himself and said, hey there, hi there, to the State Department staff, they immediately started firing all the top people at the State Department, particularly the career people who hadn't just been there through President Obama, they were there through George W. Bush before that and Clinton before that and George H.W. Bush before that, and even Reagan before that, and even Carter before that. I mean, as soon as Tillerson was brought on board, they fired four of the longest standing top career diplomats at the State Department who don't turn over with new administrations. Between them, those four people had a combined 150 years of institutional experience. Got rid of them. When the Assistant Secretary of State for Consular Affairs wrote her parting letter to her colleagues, she said what an honor it had been to represent the United States as a Foreign Service officer for 40 years. But now they're telling me I got to go. I mean, those are the people that they cleared out, people with 20, 30, even 40 years at the State Department. All the institutional memory in the building. The people who form the spine of America's Foreign Service in a nonpartisan way. The career people, the core.
I mean, these have been the headlines, right? Trump administration asks top State Department officials to leave. Or this one, it's a bloodbath at the State Department. Or this one, State Department carries out layoffs under Rex Tillerson. Even later, two more senior diplomats leaving the State Department. I mean, they emptied out the whole suite of senior Foreign Service officers as soon as Rex Tillerson got there. And then, after that, while he was leaving on his first foreign trip, they laid off a whole nother round of diplomatic officials with decades of experience, the most senior people in the building. And again, these are not Obama appointees, right? These are the people who have been the institutional memory and the core of the State Department for years as presidents come and go. They have gotten rid of them. They have cleared them out and they are not replacing them. And there is not a deputy for Rex Tillerson at the State Department. And State Department officials are not attending meetings between the president and other foreign officials. He likes to bring his son-in-law instead. And the State Department only yesterday restarted its press briefings, which have continued daily since the 1950s before they stopped abruptly on the last day of the Obama administration. They only restarted yesterday and they're no longer gonna be daily. And when the Office of Management and Budget announced that the State Department is in for a 37% cut in its budget, 37%? We haven't heard a peep from the Secretary of State about that. Apparently 37% cut, that will not be a problem. Looking at that thing that's happening in Washington, turn the telescope around here for a second and look through the other side. Look through the other side of that telescope in terms of what is going on in this part of Washington. If you're Russia, whether or not you have a personal preference about who you want to be president of the United States, if you're Russia, what you want is an end to the unipolar world where the United States leads the West, and you're not really part of that. Right? If you're Russia, especially under Vladimir Putin, you have no desire to be part of a Western alliance of free countries, in part because you don't think it's in your interest to be a free country. And frankly, you don't want to be part of something that is led by someone else. I mean, once upon a time, around the fall of the Soviet Union, there was a brief hope that Russia might end up being a member of NATO. Yeah, no. Under Vladimir Putin, instead, Russia has decided not just to continue to define NATO as its great enemy in the world, but to set up its own hoopty knockoff version of a competitor to NATO, which is ridiculous in terms of being any real competition, but th there at least Russia can be in charge. I mean, Russia wants the United States out of a leadership position in the world. They love being seen as a competing military power to the United States, even though the Russian military is in no way comparable to the American military other than when it comes to nuclear weapons. I mean, if, if you're Russia, you like being seen as a military power. You don't have any issue with the United States and Russia being seen as competing military powers. If you're Russia, what you really hate about the United States, what you really hate about the U.S. government, if you want to find a specific bullseye for it, it's the U.S. State Department, because the U.S. State Department isn't military force, right? The U.S. State Department is American leadership in the world. The U.S. State Department organizes the world to support international organizations, to support the post-war stable world that America leads, all right? The U.S. State Department is in charge of soft power, supporting American-led interests with countries around the world. The U.S. State Department, frankly, does support dissidents in Russia and critical media in Russia. The U.S. State Department calls out Russian elections, as Hillary Clinton did in 2011, calls out Russian elections as neither free nor fair when there's evidence that Russian elections are neither free nor fair. I mean, the one existential threat Vladimir Putin fears in his own country after 17 years in power, the one existential threat he really fears is a revolution by his own people, right? A color revolution or an Arab Spring type uprising by Russians against him. And when there have been big protest movements in Russia that have threatened to rise to that level, Putin has raged against the U.S. State Department for supporting, no, for orchestrating those protesters. If Russia did run a massive intelligence operation to affect the outcome of the U.S. presidential election, do we think they'd see that as its own reward? That's enough, okay, now we're done? Or once you've done that, then is it time to reap the benefits of that? Donald Trump never met Rex Tillerson, the CEO of Exxon, before the presidential election. Rex Tillerson absolutely had met Vladimir Putin before the presidential election. He was considered to be the U.S. citizen closer to Vladimir Putin than any other. 
He received the Order of Friendship from Vladimir Putin personally, the highest civilian award that Russia gives to non-Russian citizens. Somehow, Rex Tillerson ended up as U.S. Secretary of State under Donald Trump, who he'd never met. And under Rex Tillerson, the U.S. State Department, Putin's greatest nemesis in the U.S. government, under Rex Tillerson, the U.S. State Department has kind of disappeared. When the State Department put out its annual human rights report like it does every year, criticizing Russia like it does every year, this year there was no big public rollout. Secretary of State didn't even announce it. They did no public events. Why stress the issue? That human rights report is usually the highest profile thing the U.S. State Department does all year. This year they just press released it. Don't say a word. The more we learn about the Trump campaign and its ties to the Russian government, the more clear it gets that American investigations into that. They need to be aggressive and independent. But I want to propose that it is also becoming clear that Russia didn't intervene in our election because they like the cut of Donald Trump's jib. The more we learn about it, it doesn't seem like it was personal. It seems like it was to get specific stuff out of the United States actions by U.S. political figures to benefit Russia, right? Things like the, you know, Republican Party taking out of its platform that Ukraine should get lethal weapons to fight Russia and fight off those Russian incursions. They wanted change. They wanted change by U.S. political actors to benefit Russia. They wanted actions taken to benefit Russia. And also, we have to ask whether they wanted actions by U.S. political figures to weaken the parts of America that most annoy and that most undermine Vladimir Putin. Is Rex Tillerson Secretary of State because Russia needed somebody to stand by as Secretary of State while the State Department was hollowed out, disappeared, and muted? Because that's what's happening under him. We absolutely need an investigation of Trump and Russia, covering the campaign and before. With each passing day, that becomes more clear. But who's investigating if the Russian campaign here isn't over? Who's looking into whether this is still going on?